You know what I am convinced of? Say what? God never intended for you to get up and shave your legs and come to church some Sunday and make some kind of profession, some kind of an experience, and then go on your merry way, never to show up here again, never for your life to be changed, for you just to keep on living like a rank sinner. When I tell you God has something better for you, beloved, I'm telling you the truth. here at New Life Community Church. I thank you so much for turning us on, tuning us in. I trust, as always, that the Lord's going to bless you up one side and down the others we fellowship together here for the next several moments. We're going to jump right into part three of a series that we began about four weeks ago. It's one that deals with the issue of Holy Spirit. Hey, let me ask you before we get going tonight. Have you heard about Holy Spirit? Do you know anything about Holy Spirit? That's what we're going to be dealing with. The Apostle Paul ran up on a group of people once upon a time, and he asked them that very question. And their response to that question was very interesting to me. And I'm going to pose it to you tonight. Let's jump right into that. Actually, our text passage for this series on the want to effect is found in Jeremiah chapter 31. But I'm going to be in the New Testament quite a bit tonight. And we're going to go to Acts, first of all. Acts chapter 19 and verse 1. The record puts it this way. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Well, it would be a shame for you to leave this world, for you to even leave this telecast or podcast, as the case might be, not knowing about Holy Spirit. So we're going to talk to you about him during this particular episode of New Life Te- Telecast. I trust you'll listen intently, not only with your physical ears, but with your spirit, man. Father, I pray for every last person that's turned on this telecast by whatever means, and I pray by your word that you would speak to their hearts, help them to know and understand that you have a Holy Spirit that is for real and is given and purposed to dwell within us for a very specific reason. Help each one to know this tonight, I pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, you hang on. I'm going to be back here in just a little while to wrap things up. Keep your Bibles handy. We're going to be in them quite a bit during this particular teaching. God bless. I began to conclude part two of the series last week with this question. I ask, have you been, or if you were here, I ask, if you have been in receipt of God's outpouring, and the context of that was Holy Spirit baptism. And I'll pose that to you again this morning. Have you been in receipt of God's outpouring or Holy Spirit baptism? Every time I hear that question or one similar to it, my mind is immediately refocused on this passage in Acts chapter 19. Now Paul and his cohort, his co-laborer, Apollos, and I'm telling you a little bit about him, I told you I would, but they are traversing the countryside. Watch this. They are preaching and teaching the very message that is now our Bible. How cool is that? They were kind of writing it for the first time, if you please. Now, we know very little about Apollos by way of the Bible account. But what we can piece together, in fact, he's only mentioned a couple times, and it is just a a mention. This is one of those times. But what we can piece together underscores that Apollos was a very sharp dude. 
How many of you know people say that about me all the time? No, I'm kidding. Seriously kidding. Paula, Apollos was a very sharp dude. He was studied, meaning he was very well read. He was very articulate. In fact, he was a sought-after speaker. People wanted to hear him speak. He was quite the specimen, if you please. And it is my view, based upon what I can see, that he and Paul were just like this. Just like this. In today's vernacular, they were besties. Oh yeah, they would be besties. I can imagine those two engaged a lot of heart-to-heart, passionate exchanges regarding the deeper things of God. How many of you know what I'm talking about when I say the deeper things of God? Watch this. This is not one of the deeper things of God. Hey, you going to church Sunday? Well, I'm not sure. That's not very deep. Say amen right there. I trust that your answer to that would be absolutely positively going to church Sunday. But they had some deep level exchanges about the things of God as perhaps they lounged around the old campfire at night. And though he isn't mentioned frequently, Apollos is described honorably when he is mentioned by Paul. While Apollos is strategically stationed in Corinth, the ancient city of Corinth. Paul, we are told, I believe being led by Holy Spirit, because of what I read in other places, Paul ventures back to the neighboring town of Ephesus. He'd been through that area before. I'm at number one on your study notes. Fill this in with me. Lo and behold, as he comes back to Ephesus, there is a divine Appointment. I've abbreviated that because I didn't know how to spell appointment. But there is a, was a divine appointment awaiting him there. A group of about 12 men. How many? Now these are not the 12 apostles or 12 disciples as we know them. But these are the, uh, the Ephesus 12 I'm going to call them. And we learned that in verse 7 of chapter 19. Now I'm sure that some pleasantries were exchanged as Paul come back into town and he probably said something like, Hi, I'm, I'm Paul. How you doing? How's your mom and him? You know how all that kind of stuff goes. And, and then just bam, just cuts right to the chase and says, By the way, did y'all happen to receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, let me see your eyeballs. Who does that? Hi, I'm, I'm Pastor Terry. How are you? How's your mom and him? By the way, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? I shared with some guys yesterday, I'd have to take somebody out to lunch four times and pay for it and have a long relationship with them before I finally said, Hey, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Why did Paul do that? Why did he just go there? I would suggest to you one reason why he went there is because this is very, very, very important. Are you with me? Now stay with me. I'm going deep today. I don't want you to miss this. I want you to notice their response. And I'm back in chapter 19, the latter part of verse 2. When Paul asked them, they answered, Nay, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And I'm thinking, well, no wonder. They don't know. They hadn't heard anything about it. Do you remember last week as I closed, I talked to you about four responses to this question. Have you been filled with or received God's outpouring? Have you been baptized with or filled with Holy Spirit? Four responses. Either no, like these guys. Or I don't know. Maybe. Who knows? Or I hope so. Or yes, I know so. Again, these guys had to say no. So what happened? Paul played the role of a historian. Listen to me, disciples. I'm trying to help you. Paul played the role of a historian for a moment or three in order to understand just what they had heard. So you haven't heard about Holy Spirit. Then talk to me. What have you heard? He found out in short order that they had all been Water baptized. What kind of baptized? Water baptized by John the baptizer. That's what John the Baptist did. That's why they named him John 
the Baptist. If he'd have been a preacher today, he'd have probably been named John the Buffet or something. I'm just saying. But at that, at that very point, Paul then made sure from now on, their testimony would, would be not only that they had heard about Holy Spirit or the receiving of Holy Spirit, but that they could right now answer, yes. Everybody say right now. Well, we talked about the right now last week. Now, I believe, I believe, and I am urging you to believe that Paul demonstrated with these 12 Ephesians exactly what was demonstrated to his fellow minister Apollos just a short time before. I'm going to Acts chapter 18, backing up just a little bit. I want you to listen to Paul's uh, account, or the, the account of Paul's teammate, Apollos. I'm in chapter 18, verse 25, and I'm going to read it like this. Apollos had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately. Look at this. Though he knew only the baptism of John. What kind of baptism? Water, the baptism of John. So Apollos began to speak boldly in the synagogue, having only known the baptism, the water baptism of John. It continues on, when Priscilla and Aquila heard him. You know them, Priscilla and Aquila? Interesting couple. Who in the world is a Priscilla and Aquila? They're a married couple. They were married to each other. Paul met Aquila and Priscilla the first go round, and one of the first times he, he uh, ventured through the fair city of Ephesus. They were Paul's disciples. Watch this church. Paul made disciples that made disciples. How do I know that he made disciples that made disciples? Look at this. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, heard Apollos, who was going around preaching, although he'd just been water baptized, they invited him, they invited Apollos over to their house for some cookies and milk. Yeah. And then they explained to him the way of God more adequately. That's discipleship. They explain to him the way of God more adequately. Discipleship. Now I'm at number two on your notes. And I believe, here's what I believe, here's what I want you to catch. I believe that we can extrapolate. If I might use a big 50 cent word, it'd be a shame for me to waste my education. So I like to throw that out every now and then. But we can extrapolate from this that the very same scenario came forth as Paul, watch this, queried this inadequately baptized brood of brothers from Ephesus. I am fully aware that this is more implicit than explicit in chapter 19. However, I am absolutely 100% positive. You with me? 100% positive of that which the record bears in verse number 5 pertaining to the Ephesus 12. Look at verse 5 of Acts chapter 19. On hearing this, that is the more adequate explanation. They were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them. Have you ever heard of the laying on of hands? Boy, my mama believed in that. No, that wasn't the same thing. That's, that's a little different. She used to lay her hands on myself and my little brother quite a lot. That's not what he's talking about here. But uh, on hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. Wow, look at this. And they spoke in tongues and prophesied. You know one thing that's interesting to me? is that quite often we want to talk about that which comes before the and, but we don't want to talk too much about that that comes after the and. I want to say this and I'll move along. For the most part, when you see tongues and, and prophesied, for the most part, that's what tongues 
produces. It, 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 when it's given, if it has any worth when it is given in public, it is going to produce something prophetic or a prophecy Base. Now, I'm going to leave that. Why did I take you there? Why did we go to chapter 19, verse 5? Why did I tell you all these things? Here's why. There could be. In fact, I'm convinced there are some of you looking back at me right now, live and in person, and no doubt some that will, at some point in time, be watching New Life Telecast uh, via Cable 21 or listening to a podcast on their cellular device. I am convinced that there are some that would have to respond to this question just like these guys responded to the question. Basically, it was this. We have no idea what you're talking about, Paul. Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit baptism? What are you talking about? Our ears have yet to experience conversation about Holy Spirit reception. Now, I want to be clear. What do I want to be? Clear. I'm at number three on your study notes already. The baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus by the way, let me remind you where that phraseology came from. It came out of the Word of God, okay? The baptism into the name of the Lord Jesus experienced by the Ephesus 12 was exactly the same as God's outpouring or Holy Spirit infilling that I mentioned at the outset of this message, and I've strung it along a little bit to this point. And it's very important that you catch this. Watch this. In particular, how many of you grew up in church? Watch this. When I was two weeks old, two weeks old, my mom and daddy took me to church on Sunday for the very first time. And after that, I never missed another Sunday until I was 15 years old. You believe that? It's a gospel truth if I ever told it. So, if you're like myself, you've been in church your whole life, raised in church, or you're here today for the very first time, I want you to listen to this. I am certain that after walking away from this monumental event we read about in Acts chapter 19, these 12 men not only had a new experience, read one time happening, they not only had that, but much more. Somebody say much more. How many of you know by uplifted hand, God has much more for you? You might have about all you can stand right now, but I'm telling you, God has much more for you. But as they walked away, they, they were, there was much more that they were introduced to. And that was a new life that would bring to them a new life that would bring to them experience after experience after experience after experience for the rest of their days. You know what I'm convinced of? Say what? God never intended for you to get up and shave your legs and come to church some Sunday and make some kind of profession, some kind of an experience, and then go on your merry way, never to show up here again, never for your life to be changed, for you just to keep on living like a rank sinner. When I tell you God has something better for you, beloved, I'm telling you the truth. How many... You know what we're doing here today? I'm putting some gas in your tank. What will happen to your car if you don't put gas in it? It'll go... <laughs> and you'll turn the key and it won't crank. You'll have somewhere to go and you can't get there. You put gas in it, though, and that sucker will run. That's what I'm doing here this morning. And I just wonder how many of you come in here this morning with an empty tank and you keep turning the spiritual key and it won't go. You have something to do. God has something for you and it ain't happening. I'm putting some gas in you. Let me ask you, is your gas cap off? I passed a big old tanker truck this week come by me down the intersection. You know the big tankers I'm talking about that fill up the gas tank so we can fill up our gas tank, and they've got these little thingamajiggers on the side where they hook the hose in, and his thingamajigger was kind of just dangling down by a chain. He, he hadn't put the cap back on, and I chased him plumb to Wendy's. 
blowing the horn. He looked out the window at me like, you don't want none of this. I'm like, you don't want none of this, but listen. <laughs> your cap's off. He said, thank you. Is your cap off this morning? You know, it's hard to put gas in a, a tank. The cap's not off of it. Let me tell you, I'm pumping this morning. Are you receiving? Thank you. I was about to quit, but if you, since you said go on, I'll just continue here. Let me tell you what happened. Whew. These men just had their want to changed. You remember want to? They just had their want to changed. And one of the reasons I can honestly and accurately preach this to you this morning is because of what I read later in the chapter. Verse 18 of chapter 19. Look at this. Many of those who believe. Now, this is certainly not restricted to the Ephesus 12, but absolutely inclusive of them as I read this. I stand to be corrected. You go back and study the chapter later and let me know if I'm telling you the truth. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. Verse 19. A number who had practiced sorcery that's witchcraft, a manipulative witchcraft. They brought their scrolls. For us today, that would be books or perhaps a digital download. But they brought their scrolls together. Look what happened. They burned them publicly. You know, books. We went to the book fair up in Harrisonburg a week ago. What the book fair is, is this big, humongous warehouse with truckloads of books you can't hardly see from one end to the other it's books that they couldn't get rid of at the uh, exorbitant price in the bookstore so they send them to this place to sell them for pennies on the dollar that's where I buy my books books are a dime a dozen back then in order to make a book you had to boy, you had to go to a lot of trouble to make a book or a scroll so it was very valuable and if anything ended up if somebody was going to take the time to put it in a scroll it, it was very valuable so you understand what was going on in the fire you understand what they were using for kindling here it was something very valuable they burned them publicly look at this when they calculated the value of the books the total came to 50,000 drachmas how many of you know that's a lot of drachmas? What's a drachma? Watch this. It's amazing to me how theologians fuss about this. That's not the point. The amount is really not the point. The point, beloved, is that this, this represented something very valuable to them. Something very valuable. How many of you know that today, right now, ticket prices to get into certain events can be very valuable? Am I right? Take, for example, if you were the proud owner of a ticket to a Washington Redskins football game. Oh, boy, that thing is worth, yeah, like $4. And I think with that, you get a hot dog and a large drink and get to stand on the sideline with a coach and call two plays, I think. <laughs> but how many of you know, if you, if you had a ticket to the, say it with me, the Super Bowl, oh, you'd be the envy of the neighborhood, wouldn't you? It'd be valuable. A ticket, a ticket's a ticket, isn't it? It's just a little piece of paper with some stuff on it. These books were valuable. Don't get caught up on the amount. They were valuable. And these people burned them. In this way, we're told in verse 20, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Things like this happening all over because God was moving in these people's lives. Watch this. Previously, prior to this experience, their want to was devoted to occult practices, manipulative witchcraft. But thankfully now, that was considered trash to be burned. A lost person has a difficult time understanding this concept. But born again people begin to understand. How many of you know that what we read here is a drastic and complete transformation 
of the want to. By the way, can I say this to you parenthetically? The sins, it's mentioned here in Ephesians chapter 19, they were socially acceptable. It was the cultural norm. It would have been politically correct. Check it out. I told you the Super Bowl ticket story to tell you this. If you had one of these scrolls, you were involved in these occult practices, you'd be the cool kid on the block. Oh, everybody would want to be you. And now they are burning their wares. Why? Because their want to has changed. Even so, these things that they were doing, God said those things were wrong. It was sin. Even though it was socially acceptable, a cultural norm or politically correct. You know who determines right and wrong? God does. Now here's something that's been impressed on my spirit this week that I am inspired to impress upon you. Here it is, number four, on your study notes. Watch this because we're going to act it out for you very shortly. And I want you to, this is audience participation time. Are you ready for this? Fill in number four with it. Beloved, we're going to cut in right there tonight. Let me ask you this. Have you had your want to changed? Do you still deep down on the inside want to do things that are displeasing to God? You want to serve yourself and not His purpose and plan for your life? God can change your want to by Holy Spirit. And that's what we've been trying to talk to you about. And I want to encourage you to find that experience in your life. These men that we've read about here in our text, or actually our, one of our uh, scriptures tonight here in Acts chapter 19, these men, these disciples of Christ, discovered Holy Spirit, and it changed their life, revolutionized their life, and it will revolutionize yours as well, as it brings to you a power and an influence and a want to, to be about the things of God. That's my prayer for you. Father, I pray for every person listening into this telecast right now. By the power of the Spirit, I pray that you challenge them to know and understand your word and know and understand they can be in receipt of your Spirit that will give them a want to, to pursue your purpose and plan for their life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, we do have a regular schedule of services here at New Life. We'd love to have you. Uh, contact information is there on the screen. Also, if you have some questions concerning anything we've talked about, you might find our web address or be able to contact us through our website. We'd love to hear from you. I'm Terry Knight, the pastor of New Life Community Church. Got to get out of here. God bless you. Trust you're going to have a great week. And remember, my friends, Jesus is coming back. Is he coming back? <laughs>